to Canada 20 years ago in search of a more certain and prosperous future. During the time when her country was undergoing a tumultuous transition away from a former socialistic regime. Given her lived experience, she has a unique perspective on current events and tendencies of the Western civilization. And she would like to share them with you today. My recent conversation with her reminded me that the world is not divided based on religious, lingual, or racial divisions, but on a, but on a spectrum between an objective morality and a system of no values. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lubitsa Kiri. Okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, creating this platform uh, for people to express uh, their opinions and different perspectives of seeing the world because I think, and basically that's my speech is going to be touching on that, that this is becoming maybe less and less usual uh, for people to be coming together and expressing uh, themselves in a, in a free way. So uh, we will continue talking about empires as well a little bit. And I will also start this presentation with a story. And given the, given the title of my presentation, you might expect that my story will be fuzzy, Disney-like story, because my presentation is titled uh, Tinkerbell and the Spirit of the West. But um, this story will be grim, as stories from the Central or Eastern Europe usually are. This one perhaps even too grim for Grimm Brothers. So. Let's get started. Once upon a time, on a Christmas day of 1901, a little girl was born in a beautiful city of medieval kings, beautiful castles, and hundred spires. That city was called Prague. She was blessed with gifts of kindness and courage, and naturally stuck to her moral principles, no matter how hard that would make her life be. So much so that when she was 17, this was the time that we now know as World War I. She was expelled from her school for taking part in an anti-war demonstration. Prague was at the time part of Austro-Hungarian Empire, although not much longer. She was not discouraged. In fact, her desire to shape a better world just grew. She went to study law at the pre prestigious Charles's University, still in her hometown, Prague, which now was a capital of freshly minted country, Czechoslovakia, that emerged as a result of the Austro-Hungarian Empire losing the war and being split apart by internal as well as external forces, which you know about. She became a social justice warrior, I have to make a comment, the old school type, and a strong advocate for female rights. And then another cloud of darkness enshrouded Europe. The expansionistic aspirations of the neighboring Germans grew more and more insatiable, eyeing their eastern borders and making demands that it becomes their territory. Aided by the Western leaders, somehow forgetting to include the representatives of the Czechoslovak government, the Munich Agreement, signed on September 30th, 1938, decided that Czechoslovakia gives up one of its parts, Sutherland, Sudetland, you know that, to Germany. But as we know, it didn't stop there. When German troops came to occupy Prague, she stayed true to herself and her desire for peace and world of justice. So she joined an underground resistance movement. It wasn't long before Gestapo arrested her and she was marched into a concentration camp in Terezin. The court in Dresden demanded her death penalty. Yet again, she got lucky, escaping the Grim Reaper by the skin of her teeth, as in 1945, USSR and also USA forces advanced and she was released. And what do you think? Did she live happily ever after after this? <laughs> okay, I don't think so. Let's have a look. After liberation from Nazi occupation, she was elected to be a member of parliament, which for a uh, woman at the time was quite an achievement. 
representing Social Democratic Party, full of hope and energy to shape a better future for her new homeland, or Czechoslovakia as a new country. And then in 1948, communist coup took over the country. Okay, very too brilliant. All right, let me ask you, what is the first job you must do when you want to establish a monolithic system of governance? Get rid of dissent, eliminate all the opposition. And since killing of all the opposing forces is too demanding and perhaps impractical, the tools must be more efficient and far reaching. So what do you think is the most efficient way to establish this? I would say by way of fear. And how do we generate enough fear? By showing unscrupulousness big enough that it will silence even the birds on trees. So the girl in our story became a perfect object for a showcase trial. By the time she was already married and also a mother of a small child, that was even better for this insidious purpose. So she was arrested and accused of plotting to overthrow the government. <coughs> she was investigated, tortured and put on show for everyone to see in a carefully orchestrated public trial which began on May 31st, 1950. Albert Einstein, Winston Churchill, Eleanor Roosevelt, all pleaded on her behalf, but the desire for absolute power was stronger than any moral fiber. The public torment ended on June 8th of the same year. She was hanged. But her executioners did such a bad job at her execution that she remained alive for 13 additional grueling minutes. That's how long it took her, took them to strangle her fully. Her name was Milada Horakova. As you can imagine, this showcase trial was quite successful. It was not the only one, but that was quite successful. The opposition was, to the large extent, extinguished, and the new Czechoslovak Socialistic Republic could start a path towards the brighter tomorrow without all this noise, all this noise from the enemies of the state. Before Milada died, she said something we here in the West might have taken a bit too much for granted, but perhaps are now realizing the importance of this simple yet profound statement and what it actually means when it's gone. I believe we should be able to have different opinions. Milada Horakova. Okay, so let's move forward in time. I was born, full disclosure, in 1976 in a small town called Stropko, located in a forgotten northeast corner of my country in an ancient settlement on the river bank of Ondava in a peaceful valley of gently undulating hills of Carpathian mountains. By that time, the Czechoslovak Socialistic Republic, run by one party government, was fully established and nobody remembered Milada <coughs> Horakova. The so-called enemies of the state were either fully silent, minding their own business as much as they could, or else they would be used as a convenient labor in the uranium mines, or in better cases would be shoveling coal into school furnaces, no matter their qualifications or university degrees their children face the prospect of no access to higher education. So if you had any ambitions in life, in life, you better comply and be politically aligned, at least in appearances. This was actually the case of my uncle, who despite a family's open dislike, uh, made for himself a decision to join the Communist Party. And after becoming a nuclear engineer, climbed up the ladder to become the president of the Slovak Academy of Sciences, which was a big achievement. To the contrast of my father, a biochemical engineer who remained communism free, but extremely frustrated with limitations that this decision created for him in his life. The centrally run economy relied on five-year plans. 
Each town was equipped with at least one main factory, which produced one unique product for the whole republic and a little bit of extra for export, but not much, and then one collective farm. Those were the main employers, and there were officially no unemployed people, as uh, the core tenant of socialism, we didn't achieve actually communism, that's another discussion, but that socialism that we knew was the right to work. So my father was running the environmental department in a factory. We called progressively for that time Tesla. Their only job was to produce phones for CSSR, which is Czechoslovak Socialistic Republic, and also for USSR market. My mother was a manager of one of those co-op businesses in, uh, on the farm. They were making instant tea. Again, uh, they had no need to worry about demand as that was guaranteed. So I, I don't think it was that stressful for them. And how was life for me? Actually, not bad. We had free swimming lessons, skiing lessons. That was all part of our curriculum. The education academically was strong. Although the teachers didn't care about our emotional well-being, we didn't care about theirs either. <laughs> Addressing uh, them as comrade was so commonplace, it sort of lost meaning. We had free camps, um, like fun camps, every summer to look forward to that took me to the eastern part of Germany, Hungary, Poland, Czech part of our uh, republic, Slovakia, all over the place. Our small, previously backward, but still kind of backward town, was now equipped with a skating rink, tennis courts, Olympic-sized pool, soccer stadium, indoor sport hall, theater, and community center. And this might surprise you actually, but we were also allowed to keep on practicing, in our case, mostly Catholic religion. Most of the town was still making a regular trip to a Sunday mass. Only those that were working directly for the government, teacher, police, teachers, policemen, and of course, bureaucrats, were outrightly not allowed to be publicly religious. The rest of us, we were as Catholic as can be. We just knew not to talk about it uh, while at school or in an obvious public setting. And somehow uh, you actually learned the boundaries pretty fast, almost intuitively. You knew, sort of knew which neighbor would prefer to be greeted with honor to work and which one, uh, praise be Jesus Christ. So um, my childhood was kind of stuck between two ideologies that claimed to have a patent on absolute truth while standing exactly on the opposite side of the spectrum. One claiming that the base of everything is my materia, that was communism, and the other God personified, each trying to compete for my mind. <coughs> Fortunately, in my case, it didn't go well for either. In fact, being raised in between the tectonic plates of these two contrastful, yet somehow exactly similar ideologies fostered an emergence of, I would say, critical thinking, but that actually became apparent to me only later in life. While in childhood, the Catholic mass or communist assemblies represented nothing else but lots of standing around, legs hurting, listening to some boring blah, blah, blah from a middle-aged man. Um, and I coped. I coped by escaping into my dreamland. For example, thinking about the stories of my ancestors uh, who must have been in the same church since it was built in the 14th century, or observing, we have this picture there, there was this weirdly twisted foot of Archangel Michael on the Baroque painting about me, or wondering, actually, that's really true, why communist cadres always end up with the same round belly as if it was a mandatory requirement for climbing up the hierarchy of communism. And if the overbleached, crap looking 80s hair of my teacher is as feathery and soft to touch as it looks. If my mother or my, um, of one of my teachers, and sometimes that happened, asked me a control question, I, if I remembered the main premise of the sermon or the communist speech, I couldn't tell them. I couldn't tell them if my life depended on it. It all went right over my head. Okay, so why am I standing here in this room full of libertarians presenting in a seminar that discusses capitalism when what I share with you states that my childhood during socialism was actually quite prosperous and quite nice. Okay, let's see. 
because in my view the biggest danger of the monolithic systems such as what i have experienced is communist run socialism but other of similar nature as well or is also like answers to big problems in that monolithic way is not in the way they operate but in a way they inevitably fail actually after a rough start and once the dirty but necessary job of silencing dissent is done there is a sweet spot where these centrally run golem like monsters appear to be quite functional this is the era i have perhaps experienced or more precisely the tail end of this but once this clunky machine gathers too many at first invisible errors because there is no feedback no early feedback that don't naturally get corrected in time the cracks start forming the process of disintegration starts accelerating rapidly until the inevitable end when no amount of oiling can get the dirt covered knots and bolts on that machine moving again then the system caves in burying a lot of victims in its rubble okay in 1989 communism in eastern europe fell officially what followed was a decade of chaos and power struggle between a lot of small-minded and power-hungry groups hyenas that wanted to grab the biggest chunk of a rotting corpse government was basically mafia The process of privatization of previously state-run factories left most of the industry destroyed, creating the so-called hunger valleys, towns and villages where unemployment rate would reach something like 80%. The corrupt management and their faithful would line up their pockets, tunneling any money from factories by a series of bogus corporations. Many young men lost their life during that time in exchange for a pocket of money they, so-called white horses, would agree to have a corporation created in their name, and once they were no longer useful, they were simply shot and discarded. Small business, running small, small business or starting a small business was actually quite dangerous too, as those who dared to open a grocery shop or an ice cream shop or anything like that would right away have someone knock on their door demanding protection money. If they did not comply, their car would simply explode. It was commonplace. So commonplace that I was woken up one night by such explosion in front of our residence house at my university. I looked out of the window and went straight back to bed like no big deal. Although the unemployment was generally quite high, in my case actually I got lucky. My first job straight from university was an offer from Slovak Radio which is an equivalent from CBC here. I don't know your feelings about that. When I started, <laughs> when I started as a correspondent to the well-liked program, there was a program called Afternoon with the Radio. Now, I, actually, I was selected, I'm tooting my own horn, but I was one of the 800 applicants that got the job, so pretty good. But being a typical ungrateful youth, my attitude was not very positive about this opportunity. In fact, working for an institution that was associated with middle-aged people, really, and a region structure that carried some of the character characteristics of the fallen communism, I felt restless and I wanted to experience more. Late 90s and early 2000s was also the time when various Western-backed NGOs popped up like mushrooms after rain around Bratislava, now the capital of Slovakia, because Czechoslovakia split apart too, an independent country. They, those NGOs, really carried a certain level of poshness to us. They had these fancy offices in the most expensive historic core of the capital. They carried a certain prim promise of the future. And they were well-funded, so naturally a desirable place to work. And they were in preference of unhardened young minds they could shape. They funded a lot of programs of which purpose was to shape those young minds, just released from under the influence of the previous masters to be favorable towards the West. 
one of those NGOs, more dominant ones, and you will know about that one, was of, of course Open Society Foundation, backed by none other than George Soros. The promise of the West was very alluring to many of us. I was not an exception. Slovakia felt so small, it made me feel kind of claustrophobic. I wanted out, and I wanted westward. So being on a job, being out and about, searching for news stories for the program, for that afternoon with the radio, I happened to come across a small yellow leaflet pinned sideways on the board of the local university. Open Society Foundation, that was the announcement on it, in collaboration with Headmasters Conference of the Public Schools in the UK, was looking for 30 people from 10 former Eastern Bloc countries to spend one year teaching in a public, which is basically private school in England. Interested parties were supposed to submit a motivational essay. The deadline was tomorrow. I have spent the night writing that essay and dropped it off to their office personally just to make sure they got it. After a series of interviews, I was, I was headed to Cambridge for an initial orientation and after that, in my case, to King's School Britain in Somerset on a one-year contract. It, it was a wonderful experience, truly. The glitter of the West didn't disappoint at the time I was in. After my one year expired, I, I went further and chose Canada as my next immigration destination. Okay, let's, away, let's move away from me right now, but uh, let's look at the reason what, what happened there. Although my entry to the West was perhaps more fanciful than lots of other people, I was not a rare occurrence Hordes of young people were leaving their hometowns, hordes and hordes, lots, tons of people, their families and reaching towards West as their destination of hope, prosperity and better future. So what exactly has created this idea that the West is this promised land many people from the rest are in search of? And can we still live up to that? Or are we in a process of slowly removing those principles? that have created that promise? Are the wheels coming off? As I mentioned before, I consider that real bottom-up entrepreneurial capitalism to be a more, and safe, more favorable and safer environment. Why? Monolithic, centrally run systems might work for some time and even appear more efficient for the time being, like basic dictatorship that can turn an economy on a dime. You know that one, right? Mm -hmm. But similar to big, clunky, slow-moving machines, they are slow in correcting their errors and are hard to repair if something somewhere goes wrong. One part of commission, out of commission, can render the whole machine dysfunctional. And once they get stuck, they get stuck, becoming big, obsolete pieces of junk that can create a sinkhole once it fully collapses. Therefore, I believe we should really not aspire for such systems or any centrally run um, solutions to big problems, as yet again, we will undoubtedly suffer for it. In contrast, systems that are modular and open-ended, not attached to any absolute truth, are always open for revision. They're like living ecosystems, self-learning, self-evolving, and self-repairing organisms. And therefore, I would argue, much safer for longevity and even for societal order. When one part is turning dysfunctional, other parts kick in and carry on, all the while the malfunctioning part is being naturally healed, like a rupture in the skin. The process of repair starts immediately. White cells attack any redundancies and new cells fill in the gaps to create a renewed surface functionality upgraded. So for me, it's not really about labels. It's monolithic systems versus modular systems. That's the way I like to think of it. Monolithic systems are reliant on dogmas, absolute truths, like communism, theocracy, and I'm sure you can think of many others. Modular systems are in, in a constant process of Discovery, capitalism could be one of them. Collective mind of a monolithic system must fit everything and everyone into a predetermined form, no matter what it takes, subduing dissent, silencing uncomfortable speech, vilifying and ostracizing anyone who thinks otherwise. 
Those are the main tools to accomplish just that. Modular systems, uh, on the other hand, are by default curious. They sort of know they know nothing, therefore give themselves a space to evolve. The most important fuel for these modular self-adjusting systems is in my view honest and constant dialogue and feedback, early feedback. They don't mind small skirmishes as letting off steam, constantly fighting small battles might even prevent big wars. If you rope up just some of those conversations, maybe not even in the most sinister way, like what happened to Milada in our story, but you can do it by a right thing, group thing, indirect intimidation, social pressure, or any other way, then negative results might not be visible right away. But you started part path of regress, which grows exponentially down the path, and I would argue affecting also other elements of our life, like science and technology. And eventually, before you know it, we could find ourselves in a society where it's not uncommon to hear the news about yet another fallen bridge or other infrastructure failures. The gaps will affect all parts of our life. And this is the part where I would like to bring that favorite Disney character, Tinkerbell, as she encapsulates the idea I outlined quite well. In my opinion, for this thing we call societies to stay in optimal health, we need Tinkerbell. A small, agile creature, always moving, always tinkering, revamping, rethinking, redoing. And that's only possible when all is left out there naturally. Tinkerbell, to me, is a metaphor for free speech and free thought. And we need everything in the mix. And I would argue even flat earther need to have a platform and they need to be okay with being challenged, of course. Because we just never know what can spark that next inspiration. And inspiration leads to innovation and innovation leads to progress and progress leads to prosperity. So my message to you, let's protect Tinkerbell as she's the one keeping the spirit of the West alive. Okay. Any questions? I'm just curious if you have a personal relationship with the woman you described at the beginning of your talk. Uh, Milada Horakova? Mm -hmm. Oh, she was well dead before I was born. <laughs> no, but I mean, in, in your family, were there relationships? I mean, why? Oh, no, yeah. she was actually, you know what? The funny thing is like, about figures like that, we had no idea they ever existed. I became familiar with Milada only once uh, the socialism has been gone and those historic figures that started emerging had, had no clue that anything like that ever occurred. So it was hidden from us as part of our history when we were taught at schools. So of course, they're not going to be saying, oh, we had to kill a few people before we got where we are, right? But let's, yeah, we're now happy and everything is good. Yeah, so that was hidden. So not, not part of history at all for us. Thank you for your speech. And from your unique experience and perspective, can you give us any ideas of warning signs that you see in our civilization that we should pay very important attention to, not the obvious ones. What's going to sneak up on us? Well, you know what? Um, okay, I'm going to go for the obvious one because I think that's a really, uh, that's almost like a culmination of things that were kind of biting away at things, you know, like people maybe feel uh, less and less uh, confident sharing their full opinions maybe because of the political correctness, uh, maybe like that's my advantage of being Eastern European and say that's the way we are, you have to accept us because diversity inclusion, we just speak our mind and that's it. But I find that like uh, Canadians do, be, uh, maybe because of the being polite to other people, they do self um, censor themselves quite a bit. And I think that kind of creates these gaps of conversations, these gaps in that early feedback, which kind of grows and uh, I don't know, like the, the response to the big problem that we had with COVID-19 for me was uh, very problematic. And in fact, lots of Eastern Europeans probably felt the same way. And not probably, I know that. I did meet with a group of uh, 
Slovakians, uh, I was renewing my Slovakian passport in November, and not a single one of us were like, what the heck is going on? This is like what our grandmas experienced. This is not normal. This is not usual that there would be this mass um, direction towards one opinion and everything else outside of that is wrong. We were like, this is not good. What's going to happen? happen next we didn't know so so those were some those were things that were probably easier to be noticed uh, by people uh, that had experiences like that with those monolithic approaches to to uh, communication and to problems so yeah but I think there is more to it in in the West and you know uh, you have this book right in front of you so I think you get your answers pretty much defined there Thank yeah you. Yeah, I've got a question, if I may. Um, I understand your point about the Catholic Church being monolithic and yeah. so on. Obviously, we all know in Poland, the Catholic Church played a big role in the defeat of communism. Pope John Paul played a big part in the defeat of communism. Was there anything like that in Czechoslovakia? To some extent, uh, Slovaks are very Catholic. Uh, Czechs are very, uh, not so much. They. Um, Funnily enough, we are considered like very similar and same people, but their evolution historically is somewhat different. They were under Austrian part of the empire, we were under Hungarian part of the empire, we were more ruler, they were more like industrial um, early on, so there was more advancement. And they are more agnostic about that, I wouldn't say non-religious, but agnostic and uh, not dominant part like in Poland, but as I have outlined, it has kept the other side of the story alive enough that people did not fall into the narrative of the communism fully. You know, because we were sort of here and there. And in fact, we actually had Sunday schools in the same class where I would take my communism teaching, wow. learning, you know, uh, on Friday, let's say on Sunday, I was learning about the Bible, which was quite bizarre, I would say. But I think that kind of kept, uh, kept us uh, sane in some way. Know, like being uh, balanced out <laughs> between these two, but those two extremes, right? They're kind of extremes if you go and become super religious and don't admit anything is different than what the Bible says, or you're super religious, I would say, in a communism uh, dogma, because in a way they operated in an exactly the same way in, 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 uh, in their reliance of, on these canons and dogmas and these pre-made narratives that we were supposed to accept 100% without any um, deviations. Yeah. So, yeah. Any more questions? <coughs> yeah, I was curious about your comments about the NGOs. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to expand on that, what philosophy or you know principles were they trying to sort of set uh, people to and you know how expansive is that how common is it and you know I think you talked about this being a little bit earlier in time is there a lot of this still going on I think there is I don't think uh, well there is definitely a pushback uh, now there the Slovakia I am not going to go too much into like Slovakian position right now but uh, yeah I think there is a big split like I think people are real, not realizing but they are having objections against this uh, influence of these organizations on the direction of the country because they feel like maybe then the country is not fulfilling its objective towards its own citizens but serving some other goals and so on um, but the main at the moment Slovakia is very much aligned with the western or West, collective west as they call it right like official narrative is that collective west and slovakia are one but uh, in the 90s it was a novelty for us right these ngos were actually they felt quite amazing and i would say their promise in generally speaking oh, what is so bad about uh open being op in open society you know, what is such a bad concept about that like you know you can go it's the idea of exploring ideas and learning from different uh, worlds differently learning from different experiences and then maybe bring it back to Slovakia and improving the systems as I mentioned before we did have a big problem with corruption and that that went all the way up to the government 
So in a sense, I would say that was quite helpful and it was really helpful for Slovakia to become part of the European Union. It has aligned a lot of things. It has streamlined a lot of systems. It has reduced to some extent um, some uh, corruption that was going on. Uh, so the life did become better. No, but there is this I studied liberal arts and we had this philosophy teacher which asked this really interesting question. So how long does the rabbit run into the woods? Oh, great question. Until it reaches the middle. Because after the middle, it runs out of the woods, right? So the activity seems to be the same. When you're looking at the rabbit, it's just running in the woods as it was like running two years ago or like just a minute ago. But if it passes that middle, the concept changes entirely, but we are not aware of it yet. So it's almost to me like where we are right now, we have to ask ourselves this question, if the rabbit is still running into the wood or if it's running out of the wood now. The activity might appear the same, but has the concept that we are experiencing right now, has, this, has it changed? Or is it the same thing? So I think I don't, I don't think I have the answers, but this is the question I'm asking too. I'm seeing some signs that that speech, when it's roped up again, as I said, when some conversations are missing, are not out there, then there are certain things that cannot happen because there is certain inspiration that didn't happen and those gaps just grow. So socialism in itself as an idea might be a interesting concept might be not like in an ideal world that would be great right like if we all could get along and if it could all like work together in a nice way but it fails just because it does not accept that feedback where is the error like what went wrong how can we learn from it and what we can improve no because it does rope up those conversations and it relies on those predetermined dogmas so that was the problem and i think that's why it could not sustain itself as an economy as a society Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome.